Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here uh, once again. I, I really appreciate that, and, and congratulations uh, to Dr. Goldhaber and the whole rest of his team, Dr. Fareed, Dr. Pendleton, Dr. Fanekos, and everyone that's been working on NATF. I think this is a wonderful symposium today, but beyond just the symposium, all the, the great things NATF is doing, I, I really admire and, and commend and congratulate all of you. These are my disclosures as it relates to this talk. I do work with a number of the different companies that make antiplatelet agents, and some of what I'll discuss will be either off-label or investigational. Let me just first start with a broader overview before getting into the meat of it with antiplatelet therapy and just talk about atherothrombosis, a condition that affects many people worldwide, an increasing number of people, by atherothrombosis, I'm really referring to the coupling of atherosclerosis and thrombosis. And much of the data I present will be relevant to coronary artery disease, but it's important to realize that platelets are important elsewhere throughout cardiovascular medicine in conditions such as atrial fibrillation, of course, with stenting and bypass surgery. But equally important, aspirin has a role in cerebrovascular disease and also peripheral arterial disease. So, Platelets are important, and therefore antiplatelet therapy is important across a variety of different disease states. And the reason for that is because when endothelium is injured by any variety of different toxins, such as cigarette smoking or hypertension or elevated cholesterol, platelets adhere and get activated and aggregate and lead to thrombus formation, which results in the majority of ischemic syndromes. And therefore, a number of antiplatelet agents have been developed to target various receptors that are on the platelet. Uh, aspirin, of course, everybody knows about, and I won't say much more about. Uh, glycoprotein 2 b 3 inhibitors, intravenous agents that have been successful in the treatment of acute coronary syndromes. Uh, ADP receptor antagonists, which I'll spend most of my time discussing, have also been developed. Several of them, ticlopidine, now largely of historical interest, but the initial... ADP receptor antagonist in clinical use, and then uh, clopidogrel. More recently, prasigrel has been introduced, uh, and recently studied ticagrelor, and under continual study, or continuing study, alinagrel and cangrelor. So really a, a large and, in fact, growing number of ADP receptor antagonists. And most recently, the PAR1 receptor antagonists have been introduced, uh, Voropaxar and this compound, which was just renamed Adopaxar a couple of weeks ago. So a lot of things going on in the world of antiplatelet therapy, even over the past few weeks. As far as ADP receptors, those have become a very important target in cardiovascular medicine. Specifically, the P2Y12 receptor subtype is the one of greatest interest, and that's where, for example, ticlopidine uh, and clopidogrel and prasugrel's active metabolites bind. I'm just going to say a little word about uh, platelet and platelet activation and platelet aggregation. So, uh, as I mentioned, platelets adhere to injured endothelium, activate, and then aggregate. And agents such as the glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, which have been uh, so commonly and successfully used for many years, essentially work on this final stage, that is, at platelet aggregation by interfering with fibrinogen cross-linking of platelets, and that's uh, a useful mechanism, but potentially preventing activation of the platelet upstream, say by ADP or thrombin receptor blockade, might be more useful because it prevents that platelet activation, the release of various uh, secondary mediators of, of uh, thrombosis, and then prevents aggregation, whereas just targeting this last step, as with a glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitor, should be useful for preventing thrombus formation, but in fact, paradoxically, in some studies, has been shown to promote activation which might be why the oral glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, unlike the intravenous versions, failed to be uh, clinically successful and, in fact, were associated with excess mortality, not a reduction in ischemic events. So a subtle difference, but it might be important. Well, that's all I'm going to say about biology. Let's move on uh, now to the clinical data. And I know there are a variety of different um, backgrounds here, so I'll start off with some of the older data which at least any cardiologist in the audience will be quite familiar. The CURE study, which was published in 2001, so almost a decade ago, patients with unstable angina and non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction 
were randomized to either a year of placebo plus aspirin in purple or a year of clopidogrel plus aspirin in green. There was a 20% relative risk reduction seen in the primary endpoint of MI stroke cardiovascular death that was statistically significant in this 12,000 patient study. About a 20% relative risk reduction, about a 2% absolute risk reduction. So a large difference. This has led to the guidelines recommending a year of aspirin and clopidogrel in patients with unstable angina and non-ST signal elevation acute coronary syndromes. Around the same time, the CREDO trial came out, and this was a trial not of acute coronary syndromes, but of elective stenting. There were some patients nominally categorized as acute coronary syndromes, but these were basically stable patients, for the most part getting bare metal stents, a few got balloon angioplasty alone. And those patients randomized to a year of aspirin plus clopidogrel in this study, shown in yellow, had a much lower event rate than those randomized to just uh, a month of aspirin clopidogrel followed by daily aspirin for the rest of that year, a 27% relative risk reduction. And, and again, a relatively large absolute risk reduction as well, about 3% or so uh, in MI stroke or death. So hard endpoints significantly reduced both in relative but also in absolute terms. Uh, in trials of clopidogrel versus placebo. This was a COMMIT trial, and this was a uh, 45,000 patient mega study done in China, uh, conducted by Oxford University, where patients with ST elevation MI were randomized to clopidogrel or placebo on top of aspirin. Patients were managed medically or with lytics. It wasn't a PCI trial. And in that setting, there was a 9% relative risk reduction over the course of about a month in death, reinfarction, or stroke. And importantly, the co-primary endpoint of all-cause mortality was also significantly reduced by 7%. So for the first time in its history, clopidogrel was shown to reduce all-cause mortality in the highest risk of patients, those with ST signal elevation MI. So those are trials of acute coronary syndromes, either with or without ST signal elevation, where the data were quite strong that dual antiplatelet therapy, that is aspirin plus clopidogrel, reduces important ischemic events. Those observations, and actually all those observations weren't in, but those evolving observations led to the design of the CHARISMA trial, which meant to evaluate dual antiplatelet therapy, clopidogrel plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, in stable patients, not those with stents, not those with acute coronary syndromes, but those with stable coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, or peripheral arterial disease, uh, and also a smaller cohort within the same trial of patients with multiple risk factors, such as diabetes, but without evident atherothrombosis. And in the overall trial for the primary endpoint of MI stroke cardiovascular death, there was no significant benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy in stable patients. Uh, however, in that large subgroup of 12,000 patients with essentially secondary prevention type indications for aspirin, uh, there, there was a significant reduction about a 12% risk reduction that was statistically significant with an interaction term uh, that suggested there was a difference between these two subgroups. On the other hand, in the what I'll call primary prevention cohort of about 3,200 patients, there was no signal of benefit. If anything, the uh, numbers were going in the wrong direction, though that wasn't statistically significant either. So overall, uh, a negative trial, no benefit in those patients that are stable. However, trying to tease that apart in those patients who were Capri-like, and by that I'm referring to an older trial, uh, the Capri trial published in 1996 uh, of clopidogrel versus aspirin, where clopidogrel was found to be superior to aspirin in patients with previous MI, ischemic stroke, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. We examined that uh, 9,000 patient subgroup in this trial and found that dual antiplatelet therapy in green was associated with a significant reduction in important ischemic events, again, MI stroke cardiovascular death, the triple ischemic endpoint, compared to placebo plus aspirin over the course of about three years, a 17% relative risk reduction, about a 1.5% absolute risk reduction that was statistically significant. Of note, these really were stable patients. These were patients who, on average, for example, had their myocardial infarction two years before randomization to this trial. So their MI two years ago, they're doing fine on aspirin. They're in the doctor's office in an outpatient setting, and then they get randomized into this trial. And even at that <laughs> relatively late stage after their MI, uh, still uh, a significant benefit uh, appeared to be present, uh, and a suggestion as well that these curves are diverging over time with continued accrual of benefits. So perhaps like statin therapy, 
uh, benefit of, of dual antiplatelet therapy beyond just uh, in stented and ACS patients. However, this is a subgroup, so do need to be a little bit cautious in interpreting or overgeneralizing. Now, this is a subgroup of patients specifically with prior myocardial infarction, 3,800. Uh, and here again, uh, there seemed to be a benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy in green versus aspirin alone in blue, about a 23% relative risk reduction, again, statistically significant. And again, the sense that the curves are continuing to diverge over the three-year study period. And once more, these are patients who, on average, were enrolled two years after their initial ischemic event and who presumably were doing reasonably well on aspirin alone. So evidence that's pretty suggestive that there's something going on with dual antiplatelet therapy, even when initiated late in the apparently stable patient with either an ST or non-ST signal of HMI in the past. On the flip side, though, of that atherosclerotic coin, in patients from charisma with coronary artery disease but without a prior MI, 2,000 or so patients with multivessel disease, stable angina, but not an actual ischemic event, so no a heart attack in the past. Well, in those patients, there was no evidence of benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin alone. In fact, these curves are pretty superimposable. And what this suggests to me is that um, if there is a benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy beyond the stented patient and the ACS patient, it's in those folks that have had ischemic events in the past, a personal history of plaque rupture and thrombosis. And uh, while these are subgroup data and, and always need to be interpreted with some degree of caution, I'm aware of at least six ongoing or planned trials, either with clopidogrel or newer versions of clopidogrel, that are testing these hypotheses prospectively. Some other observations from Charisma have to do with bleeding and the timing of severe or moderate bleeding, where the bleeding was largely up front, and in the case of dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, wasn't in excess in fatal or intracranial bleeding, but was largely in excess in transfusions. And that was present in the first 9 to 12 months of therapy. And interestingly, after that, in those patients who were able to continue dual antiplatelet therapy and who hadn't had a problem uh, up to about 9 or 12 months, there wasn't any incremental risk of bleeding beyond that seen with aspirin alone. And of course, aspirin alone has a baseline. Uh, risk of bleeding. So potentially, in those patients who are continued on dual antiplatelet therapy beyond the guideline recommended 12 months or so, uh, the risk of bleeding, if they've not bled in that first 12 months, uh, is uh, similar to the risk with aspirin. Let me move on now in the time <coughs> that's remaining and review some of the other uh, data, evolving data, with respect to antiplatelet therapy. So all that data, I think, is uh, quite robust and supports uh, clopidogrel and aspirin in a variety of indications, primarily stenting and ACS. That's FDA-approved uh, indications uh, for uh, urgent stenting and acute coronary syndromes and guideline recommended for elective stenting and urgent stenting, stenting and acute coronary syndromes. Uh, but there are limitations to clopidogrel, primarily having to do, we think, uh, with uh, uh, clopidogrel responsiveness and lack of responsiveness in a proportion of patients where potentially those hyporesponders are predisposed to recurrent ischemic events and potentially hyperresponders might be predisposed to bleeding. And a lot has been written about that, but I think uh, from a practicing clinicians' perspective, probably non-adherence is a bigger deal than resistance, even though resistance gets uh, talked about a lot more. Uh, antiplatelet therapy, and this is true of statins and other forms of therapy as well, are hindered by the fact that patients are often non-adherent much more often than we'd like to think or are aware of at times. And part of that has to do with things like the expense of drugs. But even for generic drugs and even in healthcare systems where drugs are dispensed for free, non-adherence is still a problem. And I think it's a particular problem with antiplatelet therapy because beyond things like statins where there's a certain level of non-adherence, with antiplatelet therapy, there's also bleeding, and of course, sometimes that's bad bleeding. But even what we call nuisance bleeding as clinicians or clinical trialists, of course, a patient might not view as nuisance bleeding. That is, they might think bleeding when they shave or have a bowel movement or a nosebleed is actually a really big thing and a sign potentially of impending brain hemorrhage. So it's not illogical for a patient to conclude that if they've got bruising or, or easy nosebleeds that uh, perhaps that medicine isn't a good thing to take, especially if it's not making them feel better. So non-adherence really is a big deal. 